in March every year, we have our live fire demonstration at the Lafourche Parish Sheriff's Range, which we did, and we considered it quite successful. We had a nice crowd. We moved the time from 3 in the afternoon till 12 noon, so that allowed for a lot more time for people to come and fire their weapons at the, uh, at the range. During the month, we had a fortunate thing happen to us. A man gave us a forklift truck. And up until today, it almost works. We've really been working hard on it. <laughs> and Charlie over there is smiling because he's been working on it very hard. If anybody knows how to make a generator gin, we need one more thing. The alternator turns over, but it doesn't seem to produce electricity. So it might be a bad alternator, or maybe we have to reflash it or whatever. Um, also during the um, month, we had a change of guard for the U.S. Army Recruiting Service. and they. Can you hear me, Chuck? Just barely. Speak up. Really? Closer. Right. How's that? Oh, there you go. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Anyhow, we had a change of guard, and it went quite well. Unfortunately, it was the very same day as our live fire demonstration, and they had a nice plaque to give to me, and I wasn't there, but nobody told me I was getting a plaque. So, anyhow, it's on the wall if you want to see it. Um, We've had a very good month on tourist uh, visitors. All the while these big motorhomes were out in the uh, Civic Center, the first day they were in town, about somebody came to the museum and we invited them to go riding in our LCBP landing craft. Well, the word got around that convention and we started taking people riding in that landing craft and it was really a pleasure because, first of all, raise your hand, Charlie. Charlie's retired from the Army, he don't know nothing about the landing craft, but <laughs> made a good deckhand, and we went out several times, and every time we went out, the people were very pleased. The first time we went out was kind of amusing because the weather was pretty bad, and it started raining. We told them in advance, it's going to be raining. They said, we want to go anyhow. So about 15 of them showed up with heavy rain gear on, and went up and down the bayou, and nobody flinched. They just enjoyed going up and down the bayou in the rain. So. Every time we would land, they would pass a collection around, so we'd make something like 10 bucks a piece, and the first time we made $130, and the word got around that they should make a contribution. The weather got so bad the second day that we couldn't go at all, and they still sent us $100. So uh, they have a very good attitude about the museum. Um, there have been some um, association with a new um, bread, bed and breakfast over here on Bayou Black. And they've had some very good uh, attendees to our museum. We let them come in and we feed them, or they feed them in the back, and they have lunch there at the museum. And it's very good uh, publicity for us, at least I feel like it is. Coming up on the weekend, we're going to take our landing craft, our LCBP, to Lockport like we did last year. Last year we made seven trips out of the area where they have in the festival called the Wooden Boat Festival, traditional Wooden Boat Festival, if you're all familiar with that. That's Tom Butler's thing. He's got a museum there, and they have a whole weekend of Wooden Boat Festival things going on. And we promised them the LCBP this weekend. So we're going to leave for Lockport on Friday, take everybody riding all day Saturday, and bring the boat, bring the boat back on Sunday. So if anybody's interested in being a deckhand or it could be captain if you want to. So anyhow, we're going to do that over the weekend. I want to point out also that the, uh, there are some books here for sale, so that when you take a break early, you can uh, look at the books and, and uh, hopefully buy a couple. OK, our evening is going to be by Neil Bertrand. And he's got several publications, as you can see. and. Uh, he was born and raised in Opelousas, Louisiana, and now lives in Lafayette. Has come over here to give us a lecture, which he calls Dad's Photos of World War II. So, without any further ado, we'll turn it over to Neil. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chris. I appreciate it. This is Bill It's quite an honor to be here among all you fine people. Um, so, I grew up in Opelousas. I went to USL for a few years, and I lived in the same home when I was born 
the three years that my dad lived in when he was born. And there's a picture of the house in the book. That's some of my dad's baby pictures in the book. So I thought I would give a, a complete history, a biography of my dad in photos. Got a picture of him feeding the chickens with his dad. So anyway, uh, he went into war. He came back home with over 600 pictures uh, that he took in World War II. And I call that leaving a photographic breadcrumb trail wherever he went. He left home in Mallet, which is a little community on the other side of Lotel, right on Highway 190. He went to boot camp, training camp, war, and back taking pictures wherever he went. The hero of the show is this camera here. This is the camera that he used to take the photos. He had a leather carrying case made for that with a strap that he could hang around his shoulder. I have here a Japanese rifle that he found in Manila, in the wall city of Manila. It was damaged on the front end here, so the bayonet was laying on the ground. There was no way for the bayonet to attach to the front end since it had a bullet in the forestock. No telling what the Japanese guy looked like. But um, here I have his original canteen and a belt that he got in the Philippines. It says on the belt buckle of 1945. Feel free to take a look at all these. This is a presentation board that I put together when I would go into the uh, supermarkets to sell my books. I would bring this. And I remember the first day I did that, I sold 21 books just by supermarket customers passing by and me bothering them. And uh, it starts here in 1943 going overseas. I don't know if you ever heard of the King Neptune ceremony. It's like a hazing ceremony when you cross the equator for the first time. You go through this hazing process. And, well, Daddy got a certificate, and it's over there in that large frame. That's the original. I reduced it to fit uh, on this uh, board here. In his time in Australia, I have some souvenirs here. and. Uh, in New Guinea, I have the uh, New Guinea armband and I have the original with me. And pictures of Japanese uh, planes shot down. I don't know how many of you have ever heard, uh, have ever seen an original telegram. I have one right here. This is when my dad got back to the States in San Francisco. He sent a telegram to his mom and that was saved in an envelope, and you see the envelope with it, with a three cent stamp on it. So this is just an overview. I am an author and a publisher. I've published a total of 13 books. I've written four. The three cookbooks there, and the dashboard photos. The others I have published for friends, co-workers, etc. My Dad was an artist after he retired. He took up art, painted in oil, oil paintings. And I have here five of his originals that I had digitized and fit into an eight and a half by 11 size. And so these are uh, all, all for sale. Okay, so enough for an introduction. All right, so Dad's War Photos, Adventures in the South Pacific. Just for fun, this was part of a, uh, a presentation that I did a few years ago. Uh, I don't know if anybody believes in DNA, 
but I have proof of DNA. My son, Jeremy, could you please stand up? On the left side is my great-great-grandfather. He was born 144 years before my son was born. And you, can you see a similarity there in their face, faces? So I think that's pretty amazing. All right, I do have a uh, couple of websites. One is dadswarphotos.com, and then I have a website on YouTube. Uh, if you type in Cookbook Dude, you'll see quite a bit of uh, uh, videos there. This is my dad at age 65, uh, and this was 1985. All right, so if you see here Opelousas on the map, to the west of Opelousas, a little community called Mallet. That's where my dad's family lived. That's where they had property. They were farmers. They come from a long line of farmers going back to the early 1800s. And they apparently never left that uh, St. Landry Parish area. From Mallet, he went to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri to boot camp and he stayed there a few weeks. And in the book, you'll see how he, when he got there, he was skin and bones, it was like a bean pole. And then uh, uh, two months later, or whatever time period it was that he got out of boot camp, you could tell the difference, he had put on some muscle. So those pictures are in the book. From Fort Leonard Wood, he went to Geiger Field in Washington State. Geiger Field is right next to Spokane, Washington. That's where he was trained for his specialty. And I asked him, well, what did you do? And he says, well, when I went into the Army, they asked me what, what did I know how to do? And I said, well, I'm a farmer. I know how to change the oil in cars and tractors, know how to grease them and all that and maintain them. He said, good, we'll put you in the motor pool where you can do the same thing to bulldozers and graders and all of that. So he was trained how to do that at Geiger Field. From there, oh, by the way, using the 600 photos that my dad took, I was able to trace his steps on a month-by-month -month basis from home to war and back using his photos, using the captions that he wrote on the back of the photos and uh, the battalion's official journal. The officers were required on a daily basis, all day long, to take meticulous notes. If they had to uh, haul 100 loads of gravel, they wrote that down. If a Japanese um, uh, some planes came over dropping bombs, and there was a red alert. They had to mark the time when the red alert started and when it was over. So just meticulous detail. I was so fortunate to be able to buy his official two years worth, no, uh, three years worth of uh, journal. Uh, they were on CD. So that journal is what helped make this book a reality. <clears throat> so when it was time to leave Geiger Field, they took a train ride all the way down to the San Francisco area. They landed at Camp Stoneman. They stayed there, organized everything. While they were there, the officers required the uh, men to install uh, machine guns on board the ship that they were going overseas in for anti-aircraft purposes. And so they left San Francisco. Now here's a 22-year-old country boy. He's a farm boy. Now what emotions would a young man experience? What did he feel? He's seeing these 30 caliber machine guns put up on the ship. Oh man, this is getting real, real quick, okay? Um, they took off across the Pacific, they crossed the equator, and like I said, there's a picture of the original uh, 
certificate that he got, when they crossed the equator, they were getting closer to Australia, which was their uh, destination. They were headed for uh, Sydney, Australia. Well, as they were approaching Sydney, they, uh, the troops spotted a Japanese submarine. So, boom, all of a sudden, you have more fear, more apprehension. You know, if a torpedo hits this ship, that could be a major nuisance, okay? Uh, of course, by reading the Daily Journal, I noticed that the officers always downplayed uh, the, the, what we would consider a fearful situation. If the Japanese are shooting at you and, and you have bullets whizzing by your ear, oh, it's just a nuisance. So I thought that was pretty interesting. So continue on. Here is an overview of the area they're going to. <coughs> See, Sydney, Australia, down at the bottom, that's their first stop. And I put this here so you can see the relation of where New Guinea is to Australia because they're going, they're headed to New Guinea once they leave Australia. So once they get to Sydney, he has time to do some sightseeing. And as you can see on the left, there's a kangaroo, and on the right, does anybody have a clue what this contraption is on the back of that car? That is a coal burner. Oh, only one person raised their hand. That is a coal burning device that once you put the coal in that uh, device in the back of the car and uh, let, light it up, set it on fire, it produces steam, and that's what the car operates on. So it's a steam operated vehicle. The next stop is Brisbane. So they leave from Sydney, they go to Brisbane. And as you can imagine, the people going to fight in the South Pacific, that was a tremendous amount of organization that had to be uh, accomplished. Troops coming in from different uh, areas and going to different areas. Well, they go to Brisbane. Brisbane was the headquarters of General MacArthur. From Brisbane, they go to Townsville, New Guinea, and Townsville was the nearest jumping off point to head across the Pacific to Oro Bay. Oro Bay was on the southern tip of New Guinea. So Oro Bay is where they uh, were headed because there was a, an area there that they were required to build air drones. Has anybody? heard of the term airdrome. That is an old way of saying airport uh, with, with airstrips and the whole shoot and match to make uh, an airport possible. Here you see Oro Bay and then Sador and Biak Island on the top of the screen. Those are the three places in New Guinea that Daddy was stationed. So they get to Oro Bay and where you see these little names, South Borio, North Borio, East MB, Haranda, these were villages in that area and there was uh, airstrips or airdromes made by each of these villages so that was how they identified which airstrip to go work on. Other towns of importance that you'll read in the book at the top of the screen, Gona, San Ananda Point and Buna, there was some battles that happened there where the Japanese had uh, caused some damage. So moving, moving on, what is required to do work at these airdromes? Now here on the left you'll see this dump truck full of rocks being emptied by a crane hitching onto the front of that dump truck and lifting it up. <coughs> On the right is a friend of dad, Bill Habits from Ragley, Louisiana, on a bulldozer. And I talked to his family, and they told me that, well, they have a large rice farm in Ragley, and he had experience uh, operating a bulldozer on the farm. So when he got into the Army, that was a natural fit for him to operate a bulldozer and other heavy equipment. So how do you uh, create an aerodrome? So 
It requires making airstrip runways, taxiways. All of that required dirt work. If you had a swamp in the area, you had to drain the swamp. Of course, draining the swamp helped get rid of the mosquitoes, which caused malaria. Uh, it required blasting hills with TNT to get the gravel. It required a lot of smoothing and packing of the dirt. So where do you park 100 airplanes? You have to make airplane parking lots, and the Army called this an airdrome dispersal area. This looks like a zipper all curled up, and each of these black spots along that, the lines, each of those was a parking lot for a plane. And they called the, this area a hard standing. Uh, and so there was special work that had to be done to prepare each of these parking lots because you wouldn't want a huge B-24 to sink all the way down into the mud and be stuck forever. So it had to be packed real hard. Uh, the airstrips, once the airstrips were packed and smoothed, they laid pierced steel planking. Another name for that is Marston matting. And all of these 10 foot long strips of steel were hooked together. Here is a finished airstrip. Now, some of these were 5,000 feet long. Uh, the one in BIAC ended up being 7,000 feet long to accommodate the B-24s and, and all the other planes. Now, each hard standing or each parking lot, it had to have a levee around it. Now, the, the Army called this a revetment. Now, as you can see by the scale of the, the equipment on top of that levee, this must have been quite a tall revetment. And the purpose of this was when, if, in the event that a Japanese plane flew over and it hit a, a plane and the plane blew up or the bomb fragments, you wouldn't want the bomb fragments to go next door in the parking lot next door and hit the, the plane. So they had to build these barriers around each uh, parking spot. This guy is uh, Lieutenant Betson. He's pulling a packer to pack the uh, revetment. Now, I have an interesting story that Daddy told me. On a night like this, uh, there were this, okay, does anybody know what's going on here? This is anti-aircraft fire being shot at any enemy planes from at least three locations. That's why the the, uh, the tracer fire can be seen coming in at different angles. Well, there was a situation like this happened one night, and it was, they were in bed. He, there's two men per tent. He was in the tent with his buddy, and they were sound asleep, when all of a sudden, a chunk of metal crashes through their tent and lands in the dirt between the two cots. And it was a piece of a Japanese plane or something of that nature that fell through and uh, he escaped death. That was the first time. The second time he escaped death was he was running for his life. There was a, a skirmish going on and he escaped uh, without being hit but when he got to safety and sat down to catch his breath, he looked at his pants leg. There was a bullet hole that went through his pants leg, the, the cloth. If that would have hit him, it could have broke his leg. All right, so they completed their mission at Dobadura, Oro Bay area, and it was time to leave, and so they went by LST to Sador. The LST is landing ship tank. It holds troops and it holds heavy equipment like bulldozers and graders and all the equipment that they needed, not to mention all the fuel, barrels of fuel that they needed. Now here you'll see on the right side at the top, Rabal. That's on New Britain Island. Rabal was a major Japanese base and 
General MacArthur, instead of actively having an offensive move against Rabaul and have uh, an enormous uh, potential loss of U.S. soldiers, what he did was he created a, uh, a strategy called Operation Cartwheel. And he encircled Rabaul like a blockade to prevent any reinforcements from coming in and to try to uh, starve, so to speak, star starve them out of food, equipment, guns, uh, bullets, so that all of the uh, ch uh, Japanese transports headed to Rabaul, they either shot, uh, shot the ships, uh, destroyed the planes, and so on and so forth. So here they are, they're going to Sadar. The reason why, one of the reasons why, is down here, see where the words New Guinea is? There were a lot of Japanese troops going from the southern part, the southern part of New Guinea, all the way up. And now where the words New Guinea is, there was a mountain range. There is a mountain range there. And so when they were traveling on foot, the Japanese, some of them died through, uh, you know, the elements, uh, frostbite, freezing to death, and so on and so forth. So when they got to Sador, uh, one of their jobs was to uh, eliminate all the Japanese stragglers that were passing through, and uh, they eliminated several hundred of them. When they got to Sador, one of the things that they had to do was create bridges uh, and this is one of them called an H-10 <coughs> Bailey Bridge. It had to create bridges over uh, rivers, over gorges. They had to create wooden bridges. And one of the things that's interesting in the book is that in a two-week time period, they had 24 inches of rain. Now, when you have rain falling on the mountains, and all of that rain is, is draining down, coming into the river. You'll notice in the book, I have a picture of the Nankina River that very low, all right? But after two weeks of rain, the water was rushing through so fast, it destroyed uh, two, well, there was three bridges that they mentioned in the book. This bridge here was not affected. Uh, the Australian bridge was mostly destroyed, and so, uh, and then another bridge, the abutment, that's where the bridge is resting, you see those logs, the, the bridge is resting on that on each end. One of the abutments was destroyed by the flow of the river, uh, pushing all the logs and debris down. <clears throat> all right, now, here's one of the bridges that was over a gorge that they needed access to. So my question here at the top of the page, where did these timbers come from? You just call the lumber yard? Well, here in Homa, that's what you do, call the lumber yard. But over there, they had a different situation, kinda. They call the sawmill and they say, we need X number of beams this wide, this long, and so on. So this was a, a lumber mill that the equipment came in on an LST. They set up shop. I think it took, the book says it took a week to set up. And this is, a, to me, a, I find this very intriguing to make something out of natural materials, out of the na uh, natural trees that were there in the forest. Here are some New Guinea lumberjacks on the left side cutting what kind of looks like a cypress tree. They had to build a platform to get to the real meat of the tree and not uh, waste time down at the very bottom. And here's my dad on the right side, standing guard, because it was required that an, office, uh, a, an enlisted man or a soldier uh, protect the uh, lumberjacks as they were working in case the Japanese came and ambushed them. And does anybody recognize that gun? Thompson. Thompson submachine gun, Tommy gun. And so you can see that is about 5'11", 6 foot. You can see how sharp these little New Guinea guys are. 
So when they were finished there, oh, by the way, uh, in Sador, they produced over 300,000 board feet of lumber in the, uh, I think, four or five months that they were there. So it's time to move on to another mission. And so they get on an LST and they travel to Biak Island. Now, Biak Island was invaded at the same time that Pearl Harbor took place, except this was, instead of December 7th, this was December 8th or 9th, the Japanese had a very meticulous plans on where they were going to attack and what they were going to do. They also attacked Manila and the Philippines on, at the same time. So here, this is two years after uh, the invasion of Biak, and the Japanese had remained very busy that whole time. And what they did was they had installed uh, cannons on top of a ridge on the island. They installed and created pillboxes. Now, if, when I say pillbox, most people think of Saving Private Ryan when they invaded Normandy, and they're on the beach, and you look up and on the top of the hill, there's these concrete fortifications with cannons sticking out of them. That's how people normally think of a pillbox. But since there was no concrete producing factory on Biak, they created pillboxes from coconut trees. They cut the coconut trees down to size and, and they uh, created pillboxes like that so that they can shoot from on the inside and kill the, uh, the US and allied troops. Here's a close up of Biak Island. Down here, is their destination, Machmer Airdrome. The Japanese had built three airdromes, Cerrito, Barocco, and Machmer, and MacArthur's orders were to capture the three airdromes, kick the Japanese out, and improve the airstrips, make them larger and more accommodating. You'll see this dotted line across the, the map here that is a depiction of where the, uh, there was a plateau that stretched from the beach at, at, um, at water level and it raised, it rose up to a 200 foot height. That's the height of a 20 story building. And between the beach level and that 200 foot rise all across that southern part of the island there were caves in this whole system, and the Japanese were hiding in there with their machine guns and rifles, uh, acting as snipers, shooting at the US troops. On Machmer Airdrome, uh, there's a story in the book where they came very close with bullets whizzing by their ears, and the uh, guy operating the grader on the airdrome, he was run off to the, to the side. He had to quit uh, doing his job for a while because there was just such a nuisance shooting at him from those caves. It took from Jan uh, June 6th, okay now, when I say June 6th, 1944, you automatically think of D-Day. Well, that was D-Day in Normandy. But what people don't realize is Biak Island had a D-Day on the same exact date. So when the Normandy invasion was going on. There was the uh, invasion of Biak Island. Here are two types of equipment that the U.S. had. On the top left is called a Duck W-353. This was a six-wheeled personnel carrier, <coughs> amphibious personnel carrier. And this is on the beach at Biak. And the bottom photo shows two buffaloes which were tracked vehicles like a, uh, like a tank, as we know, uh, is on tracks. That's how that one moved. That, I'm pretty sure, is also a personnel carrier. Here are two destroyed Japanese tanks. In the invasion, the, when the US came ashore, uh, there was a big battle. And you see the tank on the left, you can see part of the turret, but a tank on the right, the turret was blown off. 
This is a Japanese pill box made out of coconut logs. You can see they had a little camp going. And so this, there was a mission, a particular mission that was organized by the US and allied troops to go to the top of that plateau and destroy all the pill boxes. And I'm happy to say one of the officers in charge who was an engineer, his last name is Chasson, which we know as a good Cajun name. So uh, uh, Mr. Uh, officer Chasson was in charge of this team to go uh, explode these fortifications. And here is a Japanese cannon that they disabled. That was on top of that plateau. When the Japanese were kicked out after probably six weeks of intense battle, they, they flew the coup, they escaped uh, off the northern end of the island and left behind a lot of good stuff that the Americans could use. So this is one of those things that they left behind, Japanese bomb dump. Old truck. Now, the uh, um, Americans had a good sense of humor and the, uh, the artistic ones uh, took advantage and they painted things on the side of uh, certain vehicles. And here this one reads, Tojo's miscarriage. And below it, I don't know if you can see it, but it says, so sorry, please. Here's a Japanese truck that was shot up in, uh, in a battle with an Australian soldier sitting on the, on the side of the truck. Now, here is a guy with a, that pith helmet on signing autographs. Does anybody know who that is? That's Bob Hope. He had, he and his USO uh, show came to Mockmer Airdrome and put on a show for the troops. And Daddy took this picture of him there uh, taking, signing autographs. I have another uh, picture in the book of him on the, on the stage telling jokes. This is his plane, a C-54 Skymaster. This is a, a view from, the, uh, from one angle. I have another picture from another angle in the book. All right, so now it's time to leave the island of Biak, and here, this is what's called an LST, landing ship tank. These front doors, kind of hard to tell in this photo, but they open up like a clamshell, and uh, when they're closed, they're watertight. So you can see this uh, equipment is driving through that front of the LST, <coughs> And it has to make its way to the top deck, is where they park all of the heavy equipment, and the Jeeps and so on. So how in the world are they gonna get this heavy equipment from the bottom to the top? Well, when it drives in, it stops on an elevator. And the elevator rises to the top, and they just drive off and get parked on the top deck. And here you see a bunch of the uh, troops on the top, uh, watching things happen and some troops at the bottom. And so they leave Biak in December of 1944 and they are on a mission to go from Biak to Calicoan Island, Philippines. And while they're there, they're there to do a favor for the U.S. Navy. On Calicoan Island, on the, the eastern side, they were uh, requested to build a beach road several miles long and they stayed there a few days taking care of this and one of the things that the uh, uh, journal said was there was obstructions preventing uh, the, uh, the job of, of producing a road, building a road and the obstructions were coral. Now coral is as hard as rock. And so they had to do blasting. And for a little country boy like my dad to see all this blasting going on, which he's probably never ever seen on the farm, 
there was quite a, a sight to see all this happening. So they finished their job on Calicoan Island, and now it's time to go to another mission. So they head from there to San Pedro Bay, and you see that channel going up through there? That was how they got to their next destination, which was northern Luzon. If you see that little notch in where it says uh, Luzon, that was the Lingayen Gulf. So they traveled to Luzon where a battle is in progress called the Battle of the Lingayen Gulf. Now, you have huge battleships approaching the Lingayen Gulf. One of those was the USS Pennsylvania. And the USS Pennsylvania was shooting its cannons at the tanks on shore that were shooting back at them. And they were hitting these tanks and destroying the tanks and, and other fortifications. But if you can imagine a young, a young man being an eyewitness to this huge thing, this huge battle, and seeing kamikaze planes flying into battleships and destroyers and other types of ships, that day was a bad day for the U.S. because we lost several nice ships due to the kamikaze uh, suicide bombers. So they, they have a mission. They have to go and land at the Lingayen Gulf. Their landing zone was 20 miles wide. So this is the arrow is pointing to where they are landing. And so they land all of their road building equipment. And they, their goal is to make their way down to Manila. They had to kick the Japanese out, and as the Japanese were leaving, they destroyed every part of the infrastructure. They destroyed all the railroad bridges, they destroyed the highway bridges, they destroyed the landing strip at Clark Field Airport. And so Dad's battalion, which was the 863rd Engineer Aviation Battalion, along with other engineer battalions, their job was to help rebuild the broken down infrastructure. Uh, that also included repairing uh, the hospitals that were destroyed. Uh, and they also had a, uh, in the book I find it very interesting, the Japanese had taken captive a lot of the civilians in Manila and they had kept them captive in Fort Santiago and also at the university. And what happened at the fort was they kept them in a, a dungeon. And when the tide rose, well, it flooded the dungeon. And we lost a lot of civilians that way. But there was, I was uh, told uh, and read in the research that I did, 100,000 Filipino civilians were killed by the Japanese there in that area. This is one of the cannons that my dad took a picture of, a 240 millimeter howitzer M1. It was so long, you couldn't take the whole thing at the uh, place where he was standing. But this machine, this gun was so powerful. Picture this, the shell, was 360 pounds, is how much it weighed. And that gun could shoot that shell 14 miles away. That's how much power this thing had. Well, they used this at the Battle of Manila. Now, in Manila, in the central Manila, there was what they called the Wall City. Another name that what the Filipinos called was Intramuros. Well, this was a city within a city, and the Japanese were hiding out in there, and they had to be, in that whole area had to be invaded on a house by house, building by building basis to destroy the Japanese because they did not want to surrender. In the rebuilding effort, there had to be a supply dump, and on the back of this photo, Dad wrote, need wire, 
question mark. This was a lot and of tons and tons of wire and other building material needed to repair the, uh, the port. Uh, I have an interesting picture in the book of the, the port of Manila was uh, bombed by the Japanese. There were hundreds of ships that were sunk in the port. Salvage crews came in from the U.S. Navy and they raised these sunken ships. Quite a technique they used. It's very interesting. The pier, there was a world famous covered pier at the Manila port that was just totally blasted to smithereens and the uh, engineers rebuilt it. Now, I don't know if you understand why the U.S. was so interested in helping to rebuild the Philippines it was because during the, at the end of the Spanish-American War in 1898, uh, the, Philipp uh, the Philippines were a, um, I guess you call it a, a possession, all right? So we had a vested interest in bringing that back to life. So now we get to the end of the book. Uh, there are two appendices. The first one has 14 types of World War II airplanes and uh, anywhere from B-24s, B-17s, on down to fighters, gliders, uh, and flying boats. This picture here on the left is Hung Lo, a B-25 Mitchell bomber, and the pilot was Jack Vautier from Opelousas. Jack's dad was a salesman for Church Point Wholesale, a grocery wholesaler. My dad's father owned a grocery store. So that's how my dad became best friends with Jack Vautier. So here Jack is a pilot in charge of the Hung Lo. And dad was very hurt when he found out that Jack and his plane got shot down uh, not, not very far from where dad was. Appendix two, has New Guinea natives and scenes from daily life. Uh, here is a, a couple of men, New Guinea men, with uh, the one on the right is holding a drum. I have a section of uh, photos in the, in, the, in the back of the book of uh, a celebration of Queen Wilhelmina's birthday. She was the owner at that time of the island of Biak. It was called uh, Netherland East Indies at the time. Here is a, a guy with uh, fuzzy hair, and I always thought this was funny until I realized who this guy is. He is what is called in history, uh, New Guinea history, as a fuzzy wuzzy angel. And the reason he and his fellows, uh, fellow New Guinea uh, people were called that was they were stretcher bearers. Whenever there was uh, an, a, either a, an American or an allied soldier wounded and they had to be taken to the nearest um, field hospital, well these guys risked their lives through Japanese enemy fire bringing these wounded people to uh, the nearest field hospital. I thought that was pretty cool. Here's a picture of uh, a guy with a headdress on with uh, doing their uh, celebration. Here is uh, little boys, the little small kids, little boys and girls, they didn't wear any clothes at all. As they got older, they wore something around their waist. So daddy thought it would be a good idea to create a little uh, grass skirt to go around this little boy. Now, here I have a couple of uh, images I want to show you. This one, before Google Maps, whoever, anybody here knows what Google Maps is? It's an online, uh, you can go on to google.com and, and find any kind of map you want to see. So before Google Maps, you did what you had to do. Now, what are they talking about? Well, here we go. Here's two warriors tattooed from head to toe and uh, you can make a joke out of it saying, well, the, the, 
turn left here at this thing and you go down and you cross the, the stream. But anyway, and then here's another one. This is our last uh, photo. Okay, here's the caption. Okay, I'm ready to clean the latrine now. That's dad with his uh, gas mask and rifle and all that. All right, well, that's the end of the presentation. Uh, I have dadswarphotos.com that anybody, if you want to write it down, you can go check out my website. And I have a bunch of videos on YouTube in various categories from cooking videos to genealogy and uh, several about the war, that, uh, World War II. All right, thank you for coming. Any questions? Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to uh, see if I can answer them. All right, my books are for sale. Come take a look. Take the artifacts, original World War II artifacts and souvenirs. Thank you for, I really appreciate y'all coming out. I was in, uh, Jeremy and I were in Leesville last night at the Fort Polk area and I gave a presentation there. But we didn't have quite as big a turnout because the storm, I think, kept a lot of people away. Including me. <laughs> I was caught in Houston last night. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Benito. Give him another hand of applause, please. <laughs> also, in a few minutes, we have uh, two gifts for the night. One is a, don't leave, Doug, so I need to find out what it is. I was getting a list for you. Okay. Um, what's it called? Uh, one's a poster of Casablanca. Okay. And Bill Wolf gave us another certificate from Chile's worth 25 bucks. So let's take a break and you can ask more questions and look at the books. Uh, we'll take a break now. Okay.